Good morning to everyone. Thanks for your patience as we work through a technological issue this morning. I want to thank you for joining us. I'm Trish Scorpio and I work with the Integrated Communications team at Midwest Dairy. And as you know, Midwest Dairy represents 8,000 dairy farm families across 10 Midwestern states. And we work on behalf of dairy farmers to increase dairy sales, foster innovation, and inspire consumer confidence in dairy products and practices. So we're really excited to be hosting the first of our series in 2017 in our Consumer Confidence Webinar Series. This builds off the five sessions we had last year. And this year's to or today's topic is why dairy farmers' commitment to animal care matters to consumers and customers. We have a variety of participants on the phone, including Midwest Dairy staff, we've got health and wellness professionals, industry and government leaders, retailers and manufacturers, and representatives from branded food companies. So um, we're pleased you're all able to join us this morning, and um, we're ready to get going. So thank you so much. As we kick off the webinar, I wanted to just give you a little bit of context and background about why today's topic about animal care is so, so relevant and why it really should matter to all of us on the phone. Today, more than ever, there's greater expectations for transparency from consumers. And as you can see here, 80% really want to know more about how their food is produced and where it comes from. So these aren't activist com consumers. These are uh, people who really do often like dairy, but they have a lot of questions. And I think many of you in your roles have already heard those questions or will hear them in the future. And one of those topics definitely is animal welfare and animal care. Uh, the consumers are also seeking answers from those who produce their food. So in the next slide, you can see a, a, a vet, and, and they want to be assured that farmers are committed to taking good care of their animals in the land, and that their food is produced in a way that is free from ingredients that they might view as harmful to their health or their environment. And so that's why we hope the remarks of our two speakers today will be featuring a dairy farmer and a veterinarian. Um, they'll be sharing examples of stories that we um, encourage you to use to uh, respond to questions questions from your consumers or your customers or your patients or your family or your friends, those who really want to know more about animal care uh, topics. And despite all the interests that I just talked about, we also know that people are really less connected to agriculture, and that can lead to skepticism. There really isn't a lot of uh, information. Uh, there's not a lot of clarity about how dairy farming works. Um, and since people aren't as connected to the farm, they get, may get some misinformation. And as you see here on this uh, slide from Edelman, uh, there is an information gap. Only 47% of people agree with the statement that farming is performed in a responsible way. 40% agree that U.S. farmers take good care of the environment, and 33% believe livestock are treated in a humane manner. So um, it's not necessarily that folks disagree with these statements. It's just they may not know the right answer, or they may not have uh, the ability to ask questions. And so that's why we're here today, to provide you with tools and resources and first-person experiences from our dairy farmer and vet who are our guest speakers. Let me introduce them to you. Our first speaker is dairy farmer Susan Anglin. She is owner of a 300 cow dairy called AAA Farms, and that's located in Bentonville, Arkansas. She regularly talks about animal care as she hosts farm tours on her family farm. She's going to kick off the webinar by taking us through a virtual tour, a photographic tour of her farm, and she's going to highlight various animal care practices that she and her family focus on to really ensure that our cows are healthy and comfortable. Our second speaker is veterinarian Dr. Gerard Kramer. He's the Associate Professor of Dairy Production Medicine at the University of Minnesota. And he's going to talk about how veterinarians regularly work with dairy farmers on a variety of animal care issues and really uh, highlight that collaborative relationship, particularly in the area of over her overall herd health, preventative medicine, and ongoing reproduction-related issues. After their remarks, I'd like to share a few resources that we have here at Midwest Dairy and some activation ideas that each of you can consider using to either continue learning more about animal care on dairy farms or to share the information and amplify more animal care related content on your own communications channels. And as a bit of housekeeping, we'll reserve some time at the end of the session for some questions that you have. So now I would like to kick it off and turn it over to Susan to uh, start us off on the discussion and to learn more about animal care at her farm. Good morning and welcome to AAA Farms. We're located six miles west of Bentonville, Arkansas, 
which is known as the corporate home of Walmart, but our farm was here long before Walmart. Ryan's grandfather purchased the land where our dairy farm is located in 1921, and Ryan's mother actually milked in the picture of the barn while Ryan's dad was in Japan during World War II. So you see, our family dairy farm roots run really deep. My husband, Ryan, is the third generation dairy farmer, and I joined the farm in 1984 with a marriage contract, a city girl with a nursing degree. Our two sons, Cody and Casey, are the fourth generation on the farm. And today, we now have the fifth generation, and this is Hattie Claire, who just celebrated her first birthday. She is a cow lover, as you can see. Farm tours are a perfect opportunity to share how we work every day to care for our animals and produce quality milk. And this quote from the Center for Food Integrity actually really says what I feel. It's actually showing and talking about what we do is key to being transparent. It all starts with the cows, and that includes cow comfort, feed and nutrition, animal health, and breeding and genetics. We began our tour in the milking barn. Today we are milking 225 Holstein and a few Ayrshire twice a day, seven days a week, which includes holidays and weekends. Our cows live on pasture and are walked to the barn for milking. Our milking herd is divided into four separate groups. And this allows us the ability to move smaller groups of cows at a time and lessens the time the cows will stand while waiting to be milked. We milk at 7 in the morning and 7 in the evening and usually finish within a four-hour time frame. Following milking procedures and how we move the cattle into the milking parlor are part of our systematic daily care. We make sure the cows have access to water before and after being milked and in the summer, we provide shade and use sprinklers and fans in the holding area. Monitoring milking equipment for any issues or needed repairs is an important daily task in assuring cow comfort. As you can see in this picture, this is a basic milking procedure that you would find happens on every farm, every dairy farm. You disinfect the skin with a sanitizing solution. You check the milk and stimulate the cow for the letdown reflex. You dry the teats off and apply the clean, gentle milking machine. This particular picture is a cow being milked. And I, I think it's a good reminder that no human hands ever touch the milk. The milk flows from the cow through the milk hose to the stainless steel pipe that flows into the refrigerated tank. The most commonly asked question on farm tours is about antibiotics and milk. First of all, let me be clear, it is not legal for any milk to be sold that has antibiotic in it. And that means whether it's on the label or not, there is no antibiotic in any milk. Whether in the milk barn or in the pasture, we are monitoring our cows and calves every day for signs of wellness and or illness. We do use antibiotics to treat illness in our cattle under the direction of our veterinarian. It is important to recognize the importance of good nutrition and preventive measures such as vaccination in the prevention of illness. But sometimes an animal gets sick and it is our responsibility to care for that animal and keep our herd healthy. Once it is found necessary to use an antibiotic, dairy farmers must follow protocols in place. On our farm in the milking herd, the milk of any cow that is being treated with antibiotics is separated from the milk that goes into the tank. On our farm, the milk of a treated cow is kept separated until the appropriate number of medication withdrawal days has occurred. And at that time, the milk is sampled and sent to our dairy cooperative lab to be tested antibiotic free before that treated cow can be re returned to the milk line. This is actually a picture of cows in, in our parlor being milked. We call our cows that have just had a baby a fresh cow. 
we separate that milk from the fresh cows in the same way we do for a cow that has been given antibiotics for illness. Milk from the fresh cow is being collected in the milk can that you can see just to the lower right. We are saving the fresh cow milk for the baby for the first three or four days because it has the colostrum that the baby needs. But we will also test that fresh cow milk for any antibiotics before her milk is put into the milk line because she received a preventive dry cow treatment in each teat two months before having her baby. That dry cow treatment is a preventive treatment for environmental mastitis. It's true when they tell you that milk is the most highly regulated and tested food available. Our milk is picked up every other day and goes to the Highland plant in Fayetteville, which is about 30 miles from our farm. Before the milk hauler arrives, we test the sample of the milk from the tank for antibiotics. When the milk hauler gets to the farm, he will draw his own sample before loading the milk onto his truck. That sample will be tested before he unloads the milk at the plant. The milk will be unloaded and tested again before it is pasteurized. If there's any antibiotic present, the entire load is discarded, and the farmer responsible will be paying for the entire load of milk. But none of any contaminated milk is discarded. None of it ever reaches the consumer. This is a, a picture of our DHIA, which stands for Dairy Herd Improvement Association technician. And this is Greg. He comes to the farm once a month. I just wanted to mention that uh, this sampling of the milk on a monthly basis gives us a wealth of information about the performance of each cow in the herd. And it includes a complete record keeping system to help us manage herd health and production. We also depend heavily and count on the knowledge of our animal nutritionists. Our nutritionist calculates the nutritional needs of our dairy herd based on the ingredients that are available and are affordable. It is an ongoing, changing, and challenging discussion. But as you can see from the chart, we have a variety of needs in our cows, whether they're dry cows, lactating cows, heifers, and calves. And there's many, many things that have to be taken into account. As you can see, the cows are eating in the feed barn. This is one of my favorite spots on the farm, watching the cows eat. You can tell they are in their happy place after being milked the cows walk to the feed barn to eat. Cows require good nutrition and a lot of water to produce milk. In the feed barn, the cows have access to water and plenty of fresh feed. We feed what is called a total mixed ration. The diet is designed by our dairy nutritionist that includes a variety of feed ingredients plus vitamins and minerals. The ingredients may vary depending on availability and cost but the cows will be eating a balanced, nutritious diet designed just for them. Our dairy nutritionist comes to the farm usually once a month to discuss and formulate the diet, but we also have a lot of in-between time phone calls and emails with updates. Each group of our milking herd will eat in the feed barn for a period of time. Fresh feed is also provided in feed wagons that are taken to each pasture so that the cows have access to feed and water all day. Sampling different forages is, an important, is important to making sure that we have a quality ration, and it's also a continuous evaluation process. This is Ryan sampling some uh, haylage that we purchased. Weather, weather extremes, and, well, I'm sorry. Uh, this is a picture of the feed wagon every day. We're mixing the total mixed ration. It's a daily job. Each ingredient is weighed and put into the mixer wagon. A set of large knives are in the bottom of this mixer, and it mixes them kind of like a, I describe it as a large salad bowl. And we're following the nutritionist recipe. 
Weather extremes do create stress on animals. Feed amounts are changed when we have extreme cold or heat to meet the caloric needs of the cows. Other comfort measures we use in extreme heat, we provide shades in the pasture, fans, sprinklers in the feed barn, shade cloth, sprinklers and fans in the holding area at the milk barn. In extreme cold, we utilize windbreaks, tarps on the sides of the feed barn, and if we have snow or ice, hay is rolled out in the pastures by windbreaks for the cattle to rest on. We have a great relationship with our veterinarian, Dr. Gary France. He not only helps us when we have sick animals, but he also helps us keep our herd healthy. This particular day, we were doing a herd health check that happens about once a month, or maybe a little more than a month, depending on everyone's schedule. But this day, he was, we were doing some pregnancy exams. One of my everyday jobs is raising all the baby calves. We raise all of our replacement heifers that are our future milking herds. In my view, a healthy milking herd begins with healthy calves. Pregnant cows are on maternity leave for two months before their baby arrives. Our babies are born in the field next to our house where we can closely monitor for any complication or any need for delivery help. A newborn calf will receive a bottle of colostrum as soon as possible after birth. It stays with its mother for the first 12 hours and then is brought to an individual calf hutch. At this point, I become the foster mother. Calves are separated from their mothers to ensure the best individual care and monitoring. Each calf will receive its mother's milk for the first three days and then it's taught to drink from a bucket. Each calf is fed milk twice daily and will begin to eat grain on the third day. We bed the hutches with straw or sawdust for warmth when needed. Each calf is monitored closely for any signs of illness. The most common illness for a baby calf is scours or what we know as diarrhea or pneumonia. We utilize a treatment protocol established by our veterinarian. I find that consistency of daily care is a rule for success in raising healthy calves. The calves will be weaned to a small pasture in about 8 to 10 weeks, and from that point the calves will be growing until they are old enough to be bred and begin their own milking journey. I've been very fortunate to be able to share our dairy story with a variety of groups. This is a picture of registered dietitians, but we also host public and homeschool students, University of Arkansas students in the hospitality, nutrition, and animal science classes, and mom on the farm tours. Every group loves the cat. That's a popular place to be. It's my hope that by opening the barn doors, you see that we are committed to producing safe, wholesome milk by caring for our animals and the land that we call home. Everything we do each day is meeting a standard of care that has been verified by the National Dairy Farm Program. This program is a nationwide verifiable animal well-being program that brings consistency and uniformity to on-farm animal care and production practices. To us, this third-party verification system is a way to assure a market for our milk, which allows my family to continue doing what we love, caring for our cows and producing high-quality milk. We are meeting a standard of care that gives you, the consumer, confidence that we in the dairy community are doing the right things for the right reasons. Thank you for letting me share with you today. Super. Thanks so much, Susan, for your remarks. I just wanted to share a little bit more information about the importance of the farm program. Um, on the next slide, you can see the logo. And the farm program stands for Farmers Assuring Responsible Management. 
Um, and as Susan mentioned, uh, she is a part of that program, and 98% of the milk supply is enrolled in that program. It was started in 2009, and it's really uh, that verifiable animal well-being program that really um, allows for, provides that reassurance to consumers uh, that dairy farmers are raising uh, their animals and providing the best care for them. Um, uh, to date, there's been almost 30,000 second-party evaluations, so folks who are going in and visiting these farms across the country and really ensuring that farms are following best practices when it comes to animal care and working toward continuous improvement. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a great program. So much of the dairy industry is engaged, and it really provides that third-party endorsement about the great animal care that is going on throughout the dairy community. If you want more information about the program, their website is nationaldairyfarm.com, and I encourage you all to visit and uh, if you're wanting to learn a little bit more. So now I'll turn it over to Dr. Gerard Kramer from the University of Minnesota for his perspectives on animal care. Thank you, Trish, and thank you, Susan, for your introduction about your farm. Um, I've been asked to kind of give you an example of how a veterinarian works with dairy farmers. And I'm going to try to show you that, kind of tell my story about what I do. I'm a veterinarian. I'm originally from Holland. I lived in Canada for a while and now work at the University of Minnesota as a researcher, but also I have some relationships with, vet, with dairy farmers that I provide veterinary care for. Um, so for today, I'd like to kind of give you a sense of our veterinarian's oath, um, some areas of collaboration, and then discuss how we fit into the farm program. Um, so as far as the veterinarian's oath, every student when they graduate uh, from, our, from the vet school, they have an oath. And part of the oath, I wanted to kind of share with you, kind of to sh give you an illustration of what uh, we, s we do. Um, so this is, I read this slide, it says, I solemnly swear to use my scientific knowledge and skills for the benefit of society through the protection of animal health and welfare, the prevention and relief of animals suffering, and the conservation of animal resources, and the promotion of public health. The reason I share this oath, because I think a lot of initial um, view of veterinarians is that we go out and treat sick cows, sick cows, which is obviously part of what we do, but we have a bigger role and as far as protecting the animal, preventing, preventing disease, and also have a role in protecting public health. Um, so if I go into my roles, um, one of the roles I am, I kind of focus on feed specifically, so I work and provide individual care for cows that are sick and they typically have foot lesions or foot problems. Um, so that's one of the typical roles of veterinarians that we play. For a more typical veterinarian that provides more general type practice, they might get respond to a call if the dairy farmer has or the farm has a problem with a cow that is sick, the veterinarian will go out, diagnose the illness, and then come up, prescribe a treatment, whether that be antibiotics, or maybe it's rest, or maybe it's a surgery. But that's a typical role of veterinarian care, and that's typically when we graduate our vet students, that's a training we try to provide for them to start with. Um, the next area that I work in would be routine animal care. So Susan talked about a veterinarian coming to do pregnancy checks. That's a typical reproductive exam that veterinarians come on farms and do on a routine basis. That might be weekly, it might be monthly, it depends on the farm and the schedule that's necessary or the size of the farm. For me personally, I provided this routine animal care, I provided a hoof trimming service, so I provided basically cow pedicures. Um, so because cows' feet, they grow, the nails grow just like us humans, we need to trim our na nails, we need to trim cows' feet. So that's the kind of routine animal care that I provided to dairy farmers. Um, this typically is also done by hoof trimmers, but I provided that as part of my veterinary services that I provided to my clients. The beauty of these routine animal procedures is that allows veterinarians to be on farms on a routine basis and establish a relationship that's separate from providing sick animal care. Because if usually when an animal is sick, there's other issues going on in the farm. But with these scheduled routine animal care visits, we have an opportunity to observe the whole operation and work with the farmer to identify opportunities, to discuss treatment protocols, and discuss a whole range of opportunities that I'm going to try to give you a bit of a sense of today. The next area, because of veterinarians and the role they play in individual and routine animal cares, as farmers have gotten larger and people are employed on dairy farms, veterinarians have moved into training some people on farms to provide this individual and routine animal care. Um, for me personally, that means that I train people on how to properly trim a cow's foot 
and I would probably trim a cow that has a problem with its foot. I do this for different, uh, so I do this in students at school, but also on dairy farms with their farm staff. Another area that I provide training in is in routine animal handling. For as, as I developed an interest in moving cows in and out of my chute, I developed an interest in moving cows, how to properly move cows, or how to move cows with the least amount of stress possible. And because as farms have gotten a little larger, there's people that are working with animals that haven't grown up around animals. So we've created some resources and some fact sheets it's in videos that we use to train people on how to move cows in a respectful and a low stress manner. As we've moved, as I've moved, as veterinarians work with individual and routine animal care, one of the big things that we try to do is we try to prevent animals from getting sick. So Susan mentioned the DHIA test here that comes and provide this wealth of information or data that we can look at. And this is where we focus on when we try to work with the dairy farm to set goals, to monitor, and to develop an action plan to address some of the problems that we could potentially identify with this data. So that typically involves looking at some sort of records, hence the person with the computer screen. But there's a whole range of information and tools that we teach veterinarians on how to use that data to help make decisions and improve or maintain proper animal care. If I go to the next slide, um, for me personally, that means the two areas where I work in preventative care is um, we work, the picture on the left is a picture of a foot bath. So Susan showed you a picture of a cow being teat dipped, trying to disinfect the teat. Well, we do something very similar with the cow's feet. So there's, I work with dairy farms to say, okay, how often do we need to do this preventative practice? What chemicals do you need to put into it? How do we use this foot bath? Is it the right size? And then we monitor the outcome of that intervention by looking at the number of cows that get sick. sick. Um, another example of how we use preventative care, if we go back a slide, um, if we look at the hoof, oops, we're going the wrong way, <laughs> sorry. Um, if we look at the timing of hoof trimming, so hoof trimming is something we try to do at least once or twice lactation, so we can use the records to look at the dairy to measure compliance to our protocol. So this is an example of that graph. On the bottom of the x-axis, there's days in milk, and then on the top is the number of cows that we do. So on this specific farm, we the farm has a protocol where we want to treat every, we want to trim every cow for the first time at 150 days in milk. So we can create graphs and look at that and say, if we look at the red bar, every cow, is trimmed before 150 days in milk, and then the blue bar indicates the second trimming. So on this farm, we look at that record, and I look at that and say, this farm, the compliance with our protocol is good, and the, we just monitor that and ensure that the compliance remains good. To move on to the next slide. The next area that we work on is we try to, as veterinarians, we ensure food safety. Um, if we, at the end of the presentation, I'll show you kind of how the veterinarians fit inside the farm program, but a key component of ensuring food safety is a veterinary client-patient relationship. We sometimes call it a VCPR. Um, so I have a VCPR with a campus dairy here. So that means that I'm basically the veterinarian of record. So this VCPR is a written agreement between the veterinarian and the dairy farm. So the veterinarian agrees to provide advice on appropriate treatments and drug treatments for sick animals, also agrees to be available for follow-up. And then the producer or the farmer agrees to follow the advice that the veterinarian gives. Um, this is a two-way agreement, so it's not like the veterinarian says this is how it happens. We work with the farm to create a protocol that works specifically to the farm. And as part of this VCPR, the veterinarian would provide prescriptions for appropriate drug use and then also provide treatment protocols saying if this animal is sick, you will provide her with this much antibiotic. And then like Susan mentioned, this is the withdrawal period to ensure that no antibiotics end up in the milk. As part of this ensuring food safety, sometimes we have to use antibiotics that aren't necessarily, that aren't labeled for this use because the animal agriculture or dairy industry is only a small part of um, the pharmaceutical industry. Not all of our diseases have appropriate antibiotics. So sometimes we have to use an antibiotic that isn't labeled and doesn't have a withdrawal period established. So veterinarians then follow something called the AMDUCA or the Animal Medicinal Drug Use Clarification Act. And that's basically a flow chart that allows the veterinarians to use extra label drugs. So when a veterinarian does that, we need to establish a proper withdrawal time. 
to help us provide guidance on appropriate withdrawal time, there's an organization called the Food Animal Residue Avoidance Database, and the veterinarian can approach that database and say, I'm treating this cow, so in my case it would be a cow with this specific lesion, I'm using this type of antibiotic, what is an appropriate withdrawal for this scenario? And this helps veterinarians kind of provide evidence-based data on what an appropriate drug or withdrawal period would be when they use drugs in an extra-label drug manner. The next part that veterinarians are involved in would be to ensure human safety. Um, for me specifically, that involves using ensuring that the chemicals we use in the foot bath, like the picture I illustrated before, so the foot bath would be on the right, um, to make sure that we use proper protective equipment for these harsh chemicals that are being used. So when we're filling this foot bath, that we're wearing safety goggles, a mask, gloves and boots. Other areas would be, an example, would be providing knee stick injuries. So because some of the antibiotics or drugs that we use and ought to treat animals are, could be harmful to, to the human health. Um, we try to make sure that there's resources and then we train people on how to safely give these injections safely to the cow, but also safely to the human so nobody accidentally injects themselves. Another area we veterinarians are very active in is to ensure animal welfare. As part of our oath, we pledge to protect animal welfare, and this is just an example of me doing that in a procedure. So some cows, once they get sick, we need to do a surgical procedure, and then we try we use local anesthesia and pain control after the procedure, during and after the procedure. So as you can see, this cow here, she's chewing her cud. That means the cow is basically content. She's not worried about the foot surgery that's happening at the back of her body. So that's what it's one example of how veterinarians ensure animal welfare. There's other examples of how veterinarians work with farms to ensure that there's um, proper care. If there's a cow that's not ambulatory, how do we properly handle these cows or how cows, if they need to be euthanized, how that gets done in a timely manner. Um, another area that veterinarians work in, because they have a regular um, opportunity to visit dairy farms, I think they have a role in ensuring sustainability of the dairy operation. I know sustainability is a big term, it means different things to different people, but to me it means how do we ensure that farms use their human resources, their animal resources, their environmental resources in a manner that allows the dairy, to, the dairy farm to succeed in the long term. So this is just an example of how on my routine herd visits I like to kind of do a walkthrough through the farm to kind of see if I notice if there's opportunities where the farm could be making changes or if there's things that we could improve our animal care or maintain animal care. So it might be saying, hey, we're doing a great job in this area or maybe we could improve in this specific area. So in this particular situation, we're able to identify an opportunity where the farm could deliver a bit more feed to the cows in this one specific area. As you can see, there's an empty feed bunk and these cows are being milked in the one area on the picture on the left. And the cows are showing, telling us they would like to have some food there. So this was just an, an area we identified some miscommunication between the feeder and the dairy farm, and we were able to address this um, as an opportunity for this dairy farm. And this only comes about because as veterinarians, we're on these farms on a regular basis. And we can just do a walkthrough to kind of see if we identify potential opportunities. Um, then to move on and how veterinarians fit into the farm program. This is just kind of an outline of the requirements of the farm program. There's very various other requirements, but if this is from a self-check that producers or farms can look at. So as you can see, there's several opportunities for veterinarians or areas that veterinarians are involved. The first one would be kind of the VCPR, and because of the VCPR, there's also going to be information on treatment records and drug treatment. So this kind of the VCPR is kind of the starting point and it leads into the written or her health plan, which is basically saying allows veterinarian or works where, where the veterinarian works with the dairy farmer to come up saying, if we see a cow with this illness, this is how we should treat her, this is the protocols we follow, this is the drugs we're going to use, and then this is the appropriate, this is where we write down what drugs we use, and this is how we ensure that the milk doesn't end up in the food supply. Right. Other areas where veterinarians were involved is I've given you examples of how we're involved in stock, stockmanship, for example, animal handling. Um, also, there's non-ambulatory management and euthanasia. Those are kind of animal welfare type to topics where veterinarians can provide input and training 
and how to do these procedures. Because in my opinion, if veterinarians provide a good written treatment protocol, that becomes an excellent document for training and training that or documenting that training has happened. In summary, I think I've given you a bit of an overview of how veterinarians are involved in both food safety, human safety, providing individual animal care, promoting animal welfare, ensuring animal welfare, training and providing routine care. This only happens, this creates a, this, um, these opportunities happen because there is a trust and respect, honesty and trust between the veterinarian and the dairy farmer. And we just create kind of a cycle where we can work with the dairy farm to set goals, how do we meet these goals, and then it takes honesty and trust and the farmer working together to accomplish these goals. With that, I'll return it back to Trish. Super. Thanks so much to both Susan and Dr. Kramer for sharing your uh, expertise and personal experiences. Before we move into a, some time for a question and answer, so be thinking if you do have some specific questions for either of our speakers, I wanted to just share a few ideas of resources that we have here at Midwest Dairy or throughout the dairy community for those of you who want to continue to be engaged in the topic of animal care. You have more you want to learn or you want to amplify uh, different pieces of animal care content throughout some of your communications channels. So as I mentioned before, Susan is extremely active on social media, so I encourage you to uh, follow her. She is active on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. She has a blog called The Spotted Cow Review. Today she just posted an image of spring wheat and how cows will be enjoying that wheat after it's uh, harvested and chopped because it's part of that feed ration, the total mixed ration that Susan talked about. So you'll be receiving a copy of this presentation after the session and so uh, take some time if you want to follow Susan on her social properties or on her blog. Dr. Kramer is also very active on social media, primarily on Twitter. And so if you look at the next slide, he has a couple of uh, Twitter accounts that he is providing content to. And again, feel free to follow him, engage with content, ask questions. Uh, they are both great resources for you. Midwest Dairy's also got a, a number of social media channels that we encourage you to follow. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And so feel free to just uh, engage with our content. There is often a content related to on-farm production and animal care related topics. So we are always trying to post information that we think is relevant to all of you in your various roles for uh, if you want to be sharing this information with your customers or your patients, your family, or your friends. One update that I want to just share is we have been uh, more actively engaged in Facebook Live and we use this opportunity to uh, focus and to feature dairy farmers who have provided on-farm tours or talk about animal care or um, give you an opportunity to have a real-time opportunity to talk with them, ask questions and really see um, without going directly to the farm as, as up close and personal a real-time experience with uh, sort of a mini farm tour and, and, and a discussion about some relevant topics. So, for example, during a recent session, we visited a dairy farm in Minnesota and talked to farmer Lisa Reek about various topics related to animal care on her farm. We've also visited the Iowa Dairy Center to highlight technology and the use of robots in milking and dairy farming. So, great opportunities to learn about uh, animal care on farm production and to either ask real-time question of our experts or to post those questions later and we're, we're sure to get back to you to um, get you the information you need. This slide here really talks about um, uh, the opportunity to visit a, a dairy farm for a tour and uh, we do a lot of tours for our partners. We feel this is really the best way to see dairy farmers and animals and the interaction and the great uh, focus on animal care at the dairy farm setting. Throughout the year we have tours for health and wellness professionals, dairy case managers and other folks working in retail like registered dietitians. We work with manufacturers and other food and ag and industry leaders as well as students. So if, if this is something you're interested in, feel free to reach out to Midwest Dairy and we can connect you with the right person to find out where tours are happening for you. And June Dairy Month is, is a great up and coming opportunity to uh, get to a farm at a June da Dairy Month event and we'll be posting those on our website as well in the next week or so. If for some reason you're unable to attend a tour in person, the, the, the picture here on the right that says welcome to the farm is an online 
farm experience. It is a 10-stop video uh, dairy farm tour. So you're able to really uh, click into a series of short videos and really see how milk from real cows on a real Midwestern farm become, become that fresh and naturally nutrient-rich milk that you love. And so, again, if you're unable to get to the farm and really want to get a, a visual of what happens um, and to meet a dairy farm family, we have this online opportunity for you. We also encourage you to visit our website. Uh, if you haven't been there, it's midwestdairy.com. And we have tried to really streamline where we post. We have a lot of resources throughout the site. But if you go to the Dairy Resource Center, which um, is circled there on the upper right, that is the place where um, it's kind of a one-stop shop for a lot of information. And on the circled area on the left, you can see we have on-farm resources, so a number of fact sheets about animal care and on-farm related topics. Uh, we have videos. These are uh, short features of dairy farm families, many of which focus on on-farm production and, and uh, animal care issues. And then you'll see the webinar area where we post uh, webinars like the one we're having today. And we did do a webinar last year with NMPF on the National Dairy Farm Program. So if you uh, want to either re-listen to today's webinar, we'll be posting that within the next few days. Or if you want to go back and listen to last year's webinar on the farm program, uh, we uh, encourage you to do so. All of this content is available for you to share during presentations, for you to use in a patient setting, to use uh, in your own on your own social channels or through your own organization's communications channels. For instance, if you have blogs or website content and you're wanting to focus on animal care related content, you can find it here. Um, if you're looking for a more on-the-go resource, we have an app. It's the Midwest Dairy Academy mobile app. So you can download that. Uh, you'll find that icon in the Play Store. You can download that, and it's a real um, accessible way uh, to get information on a wide variety of topics. Animal care is one of the topics that is included, but we also have information on sustainability and dairy nutrition. Uh, it's in a Q&A format, and um, there's there's a kind of talking bulleted uh, fact facts that uh, are easy to digest if you need to just get a quick view on some of these topics. There's added photos and videos and, and other resources that are linked to it. So again, something you can have in your pocket or in your purse or in your briefcase and if you need a quick resource you can, you can look to that app. And then for the retailers and manufacturers, the branded food company representatives on the phone, um, we did talk a little bit about farm. Again, I encourage you to go to that farm website, which is nationaldairyfarm.com. They have a lot of resources that you can, if you want to be really proactive in your support and, and um, uh, showcasing your support for animal care. Uh, there's graphics, there's a blog, there's a video, you can cross-link. Um, so there's a lot of content there that um, you can find useful um, if that's something you're interested in. Also, a growing number of retailers and manufacturers are starting to develop and share animal care practices on their website. And the next slide just shows some examples of some of them that we've seen out there within the, within the community. But if it's something that's of interest to you, if you're wanting to put together an animal care policy, reach out to your Midwest dairy contact and he or she can help provide examples or connect you uh, to the right people within our team or at with the farm program who can provide assistance because, again, a growing number of companies are really wanting to be more proactive um, and showcasing their support for animal care and educating uh, their customers about the fact that the dairy products that they are providing to consumers are, are brought to them from dairy farmers who are following um, the best practices when it comes to animal care. And then finally, for, for those retailers who may want to really bring the support of animal care to the point of purchase area for your customers, there are some resources from the farm program that you can work with. There are some retailers who are using this badge graphic, that round dairy farm, uh, farm program graphic. Um, in their weekly product ads, in their newspapers, in their in-store signage. They might be posting that graphic very visibly throughout the store, either via shelf strips or window clings in the refrigerated cases of the store's dairy department. So there are resources from the farm program if you want to bring that education into the store at the point of purchase where consumers are shopping. 
So as we just uh, move into the question and answer period, I just wanted to um, let you know that Midwest Dairy is here to help. We can provide expertise and resources. If you get questions from consumers or, or customers or even activists who are um, asking you challenging questions, we are here to help provide you with those answers, um, either in person or you can check out a lot of the resources on our website. If you're looking to integrate more content about animal care in any of your uh, organizational communication channels, we can certainly help you do that too. As I mentioned, we have a lot of resources that are available for you to repurpose and to use uh, either on organizational channels or your personal social media channels. And then again, if you're really interested um, as a retailer or a branded food company to talk about an animal care policy, we are here to help with that as well. So we've left a few minutes here at the end for questions. Um, if you have a question for either Susan or for Dr. Kramer, feel free to either raise your hand and my colleague Debbie can um, open your line. You can ask that question or you can type it into the chat box and we will direct it to one of our speakers. There is one question in the queue. Trish, are you able to see it? No, I'm not. Okay. The question is, I get a lot of questions, I think this is for Dr. Kramer, I get a lot of questions regarding the feed for cows and I hear they consume a lot of corn and that is something that they generally, generally are not supposed to consume. How do you suggest going about answering that question to consumers? <laughs> um, that's a great question. I think there's uh, the way I would probably approach it is that corn is like it's the cows consume corn in a variety of ways. They concern byproducts from the corn processing. Um, they concern the whole plants so as, as this corn silage, and then they a small part of their diet might actually be the whole grain corn. And I'm not cows are can digest anything, so I think they would eat. There's people that graze cows on corn fields, and cows will eat the corn. So I think cows can eat. They're very good at digesting stuff. So I think there's a variety of food sources that they can eat. And that, I don't think there's any particular forage or grain that cows aren't supposed to eat. They can digest it. It's all and how much. If a, grow, if a cow eats a wheelbarrow full of corn, that would be a problem. But if they eat it as part of a mixed, well-balanced diet, that's not a problem at all. Thank you. Another question. I feel that consumers are interested in BST and are BST, RBST usage and its effects on the cows and the milk. How should a dietitian address this? That one, Dr. Kramer, would you uh, want to address that one as well? Sure, I can try. Um, I would, if that question came up, I would I guess I would bring it from a perspective saying that as far as the cow's perspective, it increases the cow's milk production, but it doesn't change anything with respect to the cow. It doesn't affect her health because we can manage, we manage to, with the PSD injection, um, but it doesn't change the components of the milk. It's not like we can test, see a difference in the components of the milk or the quality of the milk, whether the cow's been treated with BST or not. And then if we look, People have looked to try and see if there's differences in hormones between the two milk, and there's no real differences between the regular milk or cows or milk cows milk from cows treated with BST. The other angle that I think is important to consider is the impact on sustainability, because if we use technologies such as BST and it's not restricted to just BST, we also reduce the carbon footprint of our product. So there's an environmental aspect that actually using the product is beneficial because we reduce our carbon footprint. Right, we would agree the nutrition, the nutrition profile, the nutrition package of, of milk uh, is, is no different whether a, a cow has um, had hormo added hormones or not. So I think that's, you can feel safe that and, and confident that the nutrition profile of milk is, is equally powerful from from any cow. From the same person that asked the question, but does it burn out the cow so that she has a shorter useful life in the milking barn? What percent of dairy farmers use it? 
I can try to address if it burns out the cow. I don't think the use of um, BST burns out the cow any faster. So burning out the cow, I think, if using a technology like that is like any technology we use in our day-to-day -day life. Sometimes it can hurt us and sometimes it can help. So I think using this technology, there's guidelines to how we use that technology. And if farmers are using are part of the farm program, for example, there's no way they would be burning out the cows because it would it wouldn't be prof it wouldn't make sense for them because they're trying to take care of the animal. So I think just because we add a hormone to it, we change our management to account for the higher production that the cow is going to have because of that. So we would feed her more, we would provide her with more nutrition, we would provide her with an environment that's going to allow her to su succeed because we want that animal to succeed with the practices that we're doing. Just a reminder, you can use the question box to type in your questions, or you can use the raise your hand feature on the webinar control panel. Rita, you have your hand raised. We have your line unmuted. Rita, you have stuff muted. Do you need to unmute your line? Or feel free to feed it. Yeah, yeah, that's this? Rita, you had a question? She's decided not to answer, ask her. Yeah, well, feel free, feel free, Rita, to send that in separately if, if um, you still have the question. We've got a couple minutes left. There are no questions at this time. Awesome. Point. Thank you so much. I guess, you know, as we close, I want to thank uh, dairy farmer Susan Englund and, and uh, veterinarian Dr. Gerard Kramer for spending time with us. We really appreciate your sharing your expertise and your personal experiences. And for all of you on the line, thanks for, for participating. We encourage you to take the information you learned today and join the conversation uh, when it comes to talking about the dairy industry's commitment to animal care. Again, Midwest Dairy is here to help. We have a number of resources and assistance if you have questions. Um, so feel free to visit our website or reach out to your Midwest Dairy contact if you need any help related to communicating about animal care. As a final follow-up, just watch your email for the next few days. We'll be sending you a thank you with a, a link to the webinar. We will also be sharing some information about how to log continuing education credits if that applies to you. Primarily, I think that's the health and wellness professionals. Um, and so again, watch for that information. And then uh, within the next couple of weeks, we will be sending you uh, an invitation to our next webinar. Uh, we are holding a webinar in June Dairy Month on June 8th, and we will be covering the topic of putting the topic of biotechnology into, into context for consumers and customers. So we look forward to kicking off June Dairy Month with that topic, um, and again, we'll have several other topics that we'll be featuring for the rest of the year, and we encourage you to um, participate in those webinars if they fit into your schedule. So in wrap-up, I just want to thank uh, Susan and, and Gerard again for participating. I want to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy day to listen in. And if you have additional questions, feel free to email us. And otherwise, just have a great rest of your day. Thank you.